Well, thank you very much, Jim, for your uh, more than generous uh, introduction. Um, I find that when I go around churches, I'm introduced by uh, fellow former fellow students and uh, former students of mine as well, and it can get rather embarrassing. So I'm, I'm glad that you cut that short in righteousness, because I'm sure you could have embarrassed me in public. So thank you very much for that uh, act of grace. So uh, we're here this afternoon to take a look <clears throat> at the opening of the book of Genesis. Now when Jim asked me to, to speak on this, uh, I had to make a decision as to what exactly I should uh, talk about, because there are literally 20 or 30 different things I could talk about on the, on the opening chapters of Genesis. So what I've chosen to do is to limit my time to the, the first chapter, or rather, uh, the first chapter and the first few verses of chapter 2, that is creation week. Or if you want to be absolutely precise, uh, I will be talking about uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to chapter 2 verse 4a. Um, if you want to be, uh, you know, right, right down the line as to what I'm talking about. But after I've spoken for about an hour or maybe a little bit less than that, we'll have a break I think and yes, then we'll have opportunity for questions after that. So there may be some questions that arise on areas I didn't deal with or might be related to what I've uh, spoken to, and we can have a, a good uh, question and answer period. <coughs> now, when we come to the opening chapters of Genesis, particularly as we come to these chapters as, as Adventists, normally the kinds of questions we are asking about the text tend to be scientific questions or historical questions because it's in those areas which the text of Genesis raises some some questions in our minds but when we come to Genesis we tend to be in what we call apologetic frame of mind because we know what the truth is and we want the text, of course, to support what we know the truth is and to show that other people don't have the truth because we know that that's what the text has in mind to tell. Now, coming to the book of Genesis with an apologetic frame of mind, in some ways, is quite a good thing to do because Genesis itself was written from an apologetic point of view. It has a point to make, and it is arguing not just for something, but it is arguing against something. And what it's arguing against is something quite specific, but what it's arguing against isn't something taken from our culture, from the 21st century, or from the West. It is in dialogue with the culture of its own time. Because all good theology is done in dialogue with the world in which we live. I don't know whether you would agree with that. Uh, Pastor Sweeney this morning was talking about huddling together in kind of a self-help uh, uh, as a self-help group, and other people being unaware that we are that we are there. But all good theology wants to relate to the world in which we live. And that's precisely what the book of Genesis does. And the theology of the opening chapters of Genesis are designed to say something about the issues that were particularly troubling at the time when Genesis was written. So if we can understand that, then we're in a much better position than to uh, apply Genesis to our situation. So that's a, kind of a general uh, introduction. And uh, let's, let's move in to the text of Genesis. What I'm going to do to begin with is to give a, again, a broad background for the first few minutes before I move into something which is a bit more specific. Now, Genesis was not written yesterday and it wasn't written in England. It was written in uh, the Middle East, ancient Near East in the language of Hebrew. And Hebrew has certain literary conventions which it delights to use, and it uses these literary conventions for particular ends. One of the things which 
Hebrew literature in particular likes to do is to set out its literature in certain patterns with correspondences. Uh, let me explain this by going to the first chapter of Genesis and looking at something which some of you I'm sure may have seen before. But if we ask the simple question, how is Genesis chapter 1, the story of creation, how is that set out? What is its structure? Then we get this simple diagram, which most of this will be familiar to you. We have our, we have our six days of creation here. And we are told what is created on each day of those uh, of the day of, of the week of creation. Normally, when we read, we read in a, in a linear fashion. We begin at the beginning, we work on until we get to the end, obviously. But when we see the creation narrative set out this way, um, on the first day we get the creation of light, and that gives us the distinction between day and night. Um, and on the first day, you can see that there is a relationship between day one and day four. In other words, the sun, we are told, is there to, to rule the day. The moon and the stars to rule the night. Um, the fish live in the sea. The birds fly in the sky. Land animals, uh, surprisingly, live on the land. And both land animals and humans both live on the land and are sustained by vegetation. In other words, there's a, it's a horizontal balance between day one and four, two and five, and three and six. Now, that kind of <coughs> balance is in many ways typical of Hebrew literature. It likes to set out things there with, with a balance and correspondence. But just as important as these frequently noted horizontal correspondences between the days, there is another correspondence which is just as important and which I would say uh, frequently ignored, yet probably points to the, the overarching thrust of the account of Genesis 1. And that is that at the beginning, we begin with chaos. Now, the Hebrew term for that, which I've, which I've put here, we are told that uh, in time-honored fashion, you remember the uh, English translation, the earth was without form and void. Without form and void. In Hebrew, it was tohu wavohu. It wasn't just tohu, and it wasn't just bohu. It was both tohu and bohu. All right? And that's the Hebrew way of saying chaos. Now, when we talk about chaos, what we mean in this context is that the creation is not yet what God wants it to be. It has not yet been, uh, some aspects have not been called into existence, others have not been separated, functions have not been assigned. It is all, as the Hebrews would say, it's all tohu and bohu. It's in a state of chaos. And then that's where we begin, and then through these creative acts, we finally come to the seventh day where we have God's rest and sanctification. He Shabbats, Sabbaths. So the balance and symmetry of the opening chapter of Genesis is not simply that we have these balances horizontally, but that we begin with chaos and we end with order. Now the reason I want to emphasize um, that is that that is a very significant point which Genesis wishes to make, uh, particularly when we read it in the context in which it was written, uh, of the ancient Near East. So what are the implications, first of all, of just seeing that that is the way in which Genesis 1 was written? What do we derive from that? Well, one thing we can derive is that God is a God of order. Things are set out decently, in order, <coughs> symmetrical and balanced. So God is a God of order. Also, God brings order out of chaos. Now, just to underline this point a little bit, this is of great importance. 
I only have time today to look at Genesis chapter 1. But if we take into account the whole of the what we call the primeval history of Genesis, that is the, the first 11 chapters, which take us from creation through to the Tower of Babel, that first block of the Bible, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, has a great deal to say about chaos and order. In chapter 1, we are introduced to physical chaos and physical order. But as we move through the chapters of Genesis, we meet up with a different kind of chaos and a different kind of order, and that is moral and spiritual chaos and moral and spiritual order. And these are themes which support the whole of the first 11 chapters of Genesis. So this is not just a minor point that God brings order out of chaos. It anticipates that the same God who brought physical order out of physical chaos can bring moral and spiritual order out of moral and spiritual chaos as it's developed in later chapters. Something which that diagram also points out is that human beings are not the climax of creation. Now, I have been pursued across more than one um, church car park by uh, <laughs> folk who have uh, been of the opposite persuasion. Um, and they have been uh, exercising their right in the image of God to show me that, uh, that I am wrong. But human beings may well be the climax of God's physical creation. But that is to make the mistake of thinking that what creation is concerned with is simply the bringing into existence of physical objects. But biblically, in Genesis, creation includes that, but is far more than simply bringing into existence physical objects. So human beings may be the climax of God's physical creation, but they are not the climax of creation. And we saw what the climax of creation was and that original diagram where we have the, th the three days balanced by the next three days and climaxing on the Sabbath. It is the Sabbath, it is holy time, which is the aim, the goal, the direction, the climax of creation is the Sabbath. Now, I've given uh, some presentations on Genesis to, uh, to mixed groups, um, to, um, well, to Adventists, obviously. Um, I've also given presentations to Anglicans and Catholics and um, Baptists and assorted um, agnostics and atheists. There's only one group of people <coughs> who have ever questioned that the Sabbath is the climax of creation. Seven and those years. are Adventists. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else sees it. It's as plain as the nose on your face, except Adventists. And I can see by some furrowed brows that uh, there's some here who have joined that group um, as well. Um, let me go back to the first diagram, where we have the balance between the first and second three days of creation. But this time, when we look at it, I want us to look at it with a focus on the concept of time. All right? So if we go to that now, you see we get this kind of <coughs> diagram. We begin, the whole account begins with a statement concerning time in the beginning. That's a temporal statement. When does this happen? Well, in the beginning, the very first words are concerned with time. On the first day, God creates light. And within this Hebrew narrative, it is light which institutes time. Because with light, we have a distinction between day and night. And it is the temporal rhythm of day and night which gives us the structure of time in Genesis 1. There was evening and there was morning, a first day. Evening and morning, a second day. That was only possible with the advent of light. So we could say that from the perspective of this Hebrew account, 
I'm not talking of the perspective of Western philosophy or whatever, but from the perspective of a Hebrew narrative, time begins in day one. And then, of course, uh, the beginning of the second column, we have the creation of the, the heavenly bodies. And what are the heavenly bodies there for? Well, among other things, they are there for signs and seasons and for days and years. They are there to regulate time. So the beginning of this second column then initiates the regulation of time with the heavenly bodies. Uh, and then each day ends on a temporal statement, evening and morning, a first day, a second day, a third day, a fourth day, a fifth day, and a sixth day. And then on the seventh day, God blesses and sanctifies the day itself. So we conclude with holy time. And that is the direction that this account has been going in. We begin with ordinary common old garden time, but we conclude with holy time. So whatever else the Genesis account is concerned with, it's got a great interest in time and specifically in holy time. Now if I had time, no pun intended, but if I had time and we could look in some depth at chapter 2, we would see how chapter 2 is concerned not so much with holy time but with holy space. Because the Garden of Eden narrative gives us a presentation of the garden as a sanctuary and the sanctuary is holy space. So I mentioned that simply to say that the opening of the book of Genesis is concerned with far more than just time and space. It's got a particular interest in holy time and holy space. This is a, an account, a biblical account, which works at more than, more than one level. Um, so that's as a general introduction to the broad sweep of Genesis 1. What I want to do now is to come to the relationship between Genesis 1 and the world <coughs> in which it was written. Because this, uh, th this chapter was not born in a vacuum. It was given birth within a particular historical and cultural context. And it would have made sense a great deal of sense, to the first people who read it. Now, if we can understand how Genesis relates to the, the world which uh, gave birth to it, I think we're in a much better situation to understand the spiritual value of Genesis for ourselves in the 21st century. If we do that, then I think we can see some things we might not see otherwise. Genesis 1 is obviously concerned with creation. And this is where we need to pause for a moment before we move on, uh, just to remind ourselves of something. When we talk about creation, we can think of creation as a, a separate topic we can say, let's sit down and discuss creation. Let's have a Sabbath school lesson quarterly on creation. It's a self-contained subject that we can discuss. In the ancient Near East, it never was. That isn't how matters of creation operated in the ancient world. In the ancient world, Stories of creation, mythologies of creation, these creation accounts were not ends in themselves. They were not seen as an account which gives you information about the how and the what. They were largely concerned with exploring the large fundamental issues of human existence. So creation creation texts are a vehicle to explore matters and questions like who am I 
Why am I here? Where am I going? So the main questions of creation texts, and this would be true of uh, Genesis as well, I would argue, is less, and I don't need to say it has nothing to do with this, but it has less to do with the how and the what than it is concerned with the so what. What is the significance? What is the true meaning of all this? So let's begin by looking at some selected elements from Genesis 1 and seeing how this fits in to the world in which Genesis existed. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, well very familiar opening words of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So here in the first verse of the Bible we, we have such a familiar statement and uh, the danger with familiarity is that it can blind us to uh, its significance. Because this opening sentence of Genesis is an amazing statement of, uh, of universality. <coughs> it takes us to the limits of time and to the limits of space. The limits of time in the beginning. Well, you can't get back before that, can you? Because if you can get back before the beginning, then it wouldn't be the beginning, if you follow me. So it takes us to the limits of time, but also to the limits of space. Because in the beginning, what did God create? The heavens and the earth. The heavens, this is from a, from a Hebrew literary point of view, the heavens, the highest point above. The earth, the lowest point beneath. The two extremes and everything in between. In other words, everything. There isn't anything beyond the heavens and the earth, that is the totality of space. <coughs> so in the beginning, the limits of time, the heavens and earth, the limits of space. In other words, God is the sovereign of time and space. And that's a point which is reiterated through numerous statements in the, the opening chapter. But once we've read this opening statement, it immediately clashes with the world view of the time of, of Genesis. In the beginning, God. <clears throat> because this implies the eternity of God. In the beginning, God. And uh, most people would nod their heads and say, well, of course. I mean, everybody knows that God's eternal. Um, well, no, they don't. Not in the world that Genesis came from. Because in the world that Genesis came from, the gods were not eternal. If you look at the creation epic of the ancient Babylonians, uh, known as Enuma Elish from its opening words, um, this is how the Babylonian creation account starts off. This is the Babylonian equivalent of, of Genesis. <coughs> When skies above were not yet named, nor earth below pronounced by name, Apsu, the first one, their begetter and maker, Tiamat, who bore them all, had mixed their waters together, but had not formed pastures nor discovered reed beds. Well, that's all part of a general introduction. Then, when yet no gods were manifest, nor names pronounced, nor destinies decreed, then gods were born within them. And this is one of the great uh, contrasts between the Genesis creation account and these other creation accounts, is that in Genesis we are talking about the creation of the heavens and the earth. Other creation accounts are concerned with the creation of <coughs> the gods. It is the gods coming into existence. So at the very beginning of Genesis then, there's a marked contrast with the, the world view of its time. Not just from Babylon, we've got a couple of passages here from Egyptian texts. Uh, this one, praise to you, Atum, praise to you, Kepra, who created himself. 
So here's talking about a god who <coughs> brought himself into existence. You became high in this your name, high ground. You created yourself in this your name, Kepler. Uh, then just one more. Um, here we have one of the gods um, speaking. See, I am prosperous. I created my body in my glory. I am he who made myself. I formed myself according to my will and according to my heart. But in Genesis, and not just in Genesis, but throughout the rest of the Bible, there is never any speculation concerning the origins of God. God is and always has been. Uh, and there's no speculation as to his existence. So this is at the very opening sentence of Genesis. There's friction between Genesis and the ancient creation mythologies which, which surrounded it. If we look at this verse once more, <clears throat> in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It also makes another statement which also appears self-evident that there is a distinction between the creator and creation. Now I realize that sounds so obvious that it's, it's hardly worth mentioning that the creator is external to the creation. The creator brings creation into existence. But that would have been considered a strange notion in the world of Genesis because the majority of the gods in the ancient world were, were um, manifestations of the, uh, of the natural world. So if you were to look out of the window and see, uh, I can see a tree there, then the distinction between that tree which I can see and the god of the tree, well, it's all rather mixed up. So uh, this is the origins of, not origins of, but the basis of uh, pantheistic views uh, of the world. But that's something which uh, Genesis is very, um, very separate from. So an ancient person reading this text would be getting rather confused by the end of the first sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, so what we see here is something which, uh, I can only look at certain aspects of it, but what Genesis amounts to is an argument against, a polemic against the theology of its time, and particularly the mythology of its time. That's what it has in its sights. It hasn't heard of Charles Darwin. Not yet. Okay. It doesn't have the origin of species in its sights. It has ancient mythology in its sights. That's what it's going for. And see what uh, happens as we read it in, in that way. The first statement that God makes in his creative act. Chapter 1, verse 3. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now when the ancient rabbis were teaching their uh, eager little rabbinic students sitting there in front of them, uh, the chief rabbi would read from the scroll this verse. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And the rabbi teaching would ask a time-honored question of his rabbinic students. Now, you keen little rabbinic students, you. It says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, to whom was God speaking? <coughs> to whom was God speaking when he said, let there be light? Now, what they were getting at is this. You see, if I stand at the front and I were to say to, to Jim here Jim, switch off the lights well I should add please I suppose, but if I say Jim switch off the light, that makes sense because I'm addressing a command to somebody who can fulfill that command but 
if you had seen me come into this room before there was a single person in this room and I stood at the front and I simply said, switch on the lights, and there's nobody else in the room, you begin to believe those rumours you hear about New Bowl College. <laughs> so the point the rabbis were getting at was this, that God wasn't speaking to anybody. It shows that God has power, control over matter. <coughs> that God's creation is effortless. It doesn't require any more than God's desire or <coughs> command to produce it. That creation is effortless. And that is one of the, well, once you see that point, Genesis 1 is full of the effortlessness of God's creation. Just to remind you, we've got this verse that we're looking at here. God said, let there be light, and there was light. If you move on, uh, then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, and it was so. And it goes on like this. God simply commands, and it happens. It is effortless. So what? Well, the so what is the creation. In all of the cultures which surrounded Israel, was not effortless. Creation came as the result of a battle, of a tremendous struggle. In fact, it happened so often there's a technical term for it. It's called theomachy. And you can look at that in this culture, that culture, and, uh, and any other. Sometimes when people talk about the greatest difference between the account of creation, which we have in the Bible, and the accounts of creation which exist in the cultures which surrounded it, Many times people will say, well, the greatest difference is that in Genesis it is creation out of nothing, creation ex nihilo. Now, actually, that is not the greatest and most striking <clears throat> difference between the account of creation in the Bible and those which exist in the surrounding cultures. The single most striking contrast is this, that in Genesis creation is effortless. And in the other mythologies, it comes as the result of a struggle and a battle. So if we go back to the, the Babylonian creation epic, here we have two of the uh, figures in the creation epic battling against one another. We have Marduk. Marduk is the great high god of the city of Babylon. His temple is there in the middle of the city. And then Tiamat. She is the fearsome monstrous of the deep. And they have been going at one another for a long time. And then we come to the climax of it here, where Marduk shot an arrow which pierced Tiamat's belly, split her down the middle and slit her throat, sorry, slit her heart, vanquished her and extinguished her life. He threw down her corpse and stood on top of her. And standing on top of her, he gives this blood-curdling scream. He slices her body in half, and with one half of the body, he creates the heavens, and the other half of the body, he creates the earth. It is creation through the process of battle and blood-curdling struggle. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. The contrast could hardly be, could hardly be greater. Um, so, in Genesis, there is no battle. In fact, there cannot be any battle. Because in Genesis, we have only one God. And this is one of the consequences of uh, monotheism. Sorry, the word gone for me. <laughs> one of the consequences of monotheism. In a polytheistic context, you have battles between the gods. In a monotheistic context, as in Israel, one god, one command, 
one result. It is fundamentally different. Then, if we look, uh, move on now to the, uh, the fourth day of creation, we don't have time to stop off at, at every detail here, but if we look at the um, fourth day of creation, and is continuing this point about uh, the relationship with the gods. On the fourth day of creation, we're told that God creates the, the heavenly bodies. And the account of this in Genesis emphasizes certain things. Now, the things it emphasizes are not the things we emphasize, probably, when we consider the heavenly bodies, but we're reading this particular text. And this particular text has got a particular interest in those particular heavenly bodies. So if we look at how the text is set out and how it, uh, how it underlines certain things, um, I've uh, condensed this slightly and highlighted the major points. God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. I think you can see that what Genesis is particularly interested in here are the functions of those heavenly bodies. What are they there to do? Were well, they there to separate, to give light, to rule, to give light, to rule, to separate? That's what it wants to emphasize. What do they do? Now, the account of the fourth day is of all the things which Genesis says, this is the one which is going to cause an ancient reader the most difficult time of all, probably, when we consider how the ancients considered the, uh, the heavenly bodies. Because what Genesis is saying is they're lights. Well, that doesn't uh, worry us. They're just lights. But an ancient person would be scandalized by that. What do you mean they're just lights? They're not lights. They're gods. So let's just have a look at a typical passage here from Mesopotamian astrology and the, the role which these heavenly lights have. As you're looking at these heavenly bodies, remember that an eclipse of the evening watch means plague. An eclipse of the middle watch means diminishing market. An eclipse of the morning watch means the sick will recover. When sin, that's the name of the moon goddess, when sin makes an eclipse, in other words, when you have an eclipse of the moon, you must also <coughs> consider the month, the day, the watch, the wind, the path, the positions of the stars as they stood during the eclipse, and then you can give the decision, the text is a bit uh, wonky there, you can give the decision in accordance with its month, its day, its watch, its wind, its path, and its star. The heavenly bodies are gods. That is why you need to keep your eye on those lights. Because those gods and their position are determining events in human life, human destiny, human fate is determined by those gods. Genesis says, on the fourth day, God created lights. No more, no less, just lights. So Genesis is not only rejecting any form of sun worship or moon worship, star uh, worship, it is also rejecting um, fatalism as well. There's nothing I can do because my fate is decided by the position of the sun, the moon and the stars. 
That's the beginning, of course, of well, modern astrology. I won't embarrass you by asking you if you know your sign of the zodiac, <laughs> because I know that uh, good Adventists, none of you have a clue. <laughs> right, okay. A BUC president giving you the lead there. I'm Sagittarius, you know, yeah. Um, so it's beginning in those kinds of texts where Genesis is saying, no, they do not decide human destiny. This also um, explains this, which is something which even a first-time reader of Genesis chapter 1 notices and asks. And that is, now just a minute, you've got light on the first day, and you don't have the sun and the moon until day four. Well, there we have it. So I've simplified it here. You see, we come back to this general grid. We got light on the first day and lights on the fourth day. Now, the way some people point out this is as if, you know, they are the first to have seen this. <laughs> And what a monumental mistake the author made, putting light before the light bearers. But of course, by doing it this way, setting it out this way, it is emphasising something for even the thickest of readers. They're not gods. They're just lights. The true source of light is none other than God himself. On the fourth day, he hands responsibility for light over to those light bearers. Just as later, he will hand responsibility for creation from himself over to human beings. More of that in a minute. But the fundamental point being made here is a theological point, an anti-mythological point. To make this uh, um, quite profound point, that human destiny, human fate, is not determined by the position of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Our human destiny is in the hands of this God who in the beginning created the heavens and the earth, the personal God with whom we can relate. Um, one other aspect of this too, um, because the, um, I want us, as far as possible, to see what is it that exercised the text now, I know that a lot of people are exercised about the text, right? but what is the text itself exercised about? So there's one more detail to look at here, and that is, in talking about this day, I think I've mentioned that this is about God's bringing into existence the sun, the moon, the stars. But of course, that's not quite accurate because the text itself never uses the word for sun, and it never uses the word for moon. It uses uh, the greater light, which is obviously the sun, and the lesser light, which is obviously the moon. So why not just say sun and moon? Well, of course, the text doesn't explicitly tell us this, but the most likely reason is that in the world in which it was written, the word for sun, in Hebrew Shemesh, the word for sun is also the name of the sun god. And the word for moon is also the name for the moon goddess. <coughs> so just in case some of you, I don't mean you, but just in case some of those original hearers were dozing off a little bit, this text doesn't even use the words for sun and moon, lest anybody get mixed up that the text is talking about the sun god and the moon goddess. It is the greater what? The greater light. And the lesser what? The lesser light. Not the greater or lesser god, but the greater or lesser light. So it goes out of its way to avoid even the slightest hint that what it's talking about has got anything to do with the gods, or human fate and destiny. And then this statement here, he made the stars also. That's how this translation, this version translates it. This is added at the end almost as an afterthought. 
because what it says just literally in the original text is, and the stars. You know, as if that's a, kind of an afterthought, you know, and the stars. But that takes on more significance too when we realize that, again, in the world of Genesis, the most important heavenly bodies were the stars. So in order of significance, it was the stars first. Because that tells you whether you know, you're Cancer, Sagittarius, or whatever. The stars are first importance, then the sun and the moon. But here in Genesis, Genesis can't resist just that final twist at the end. Oh, and the stars. They're just relegated as an afterthought. Yes, let's come to day six. <clears throat> now on day six we have the creation of land animals and human beings. And I just want to point out something which again is, is self-evident, but it's um, sometimes it's helpful just to remind ourselves of, of that which is self-evident. So I've, I've condensed uh, here verses 25 to 31 and just highlighted certain elements. Let me just read through this quickly then. God made the wild animals of the earth, of every kind, and then God said, let us make humankind. So, God created humankind in his image. God said, see, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Now, my reason for putting the text up there, is to show that um, at one level, Genesis wants to show that there is a very close relationship between human beings and animals. Very close relationship. Uh, human beings and animals are created on the same day. They live in the same environment and they are sustained by the same food, plants which grow from the earth, okay? So God made the wild animals of the earth. And then uh, to the human beings, God said, you will eat what is upon the face of all the earth. You shall have them for food. To every beast of the earth, you've given every green plant for food. In other words, they're living in the same environment. They're sustained by the same food and it's done on the same day, on the, on the sixth day. So. Genesis is quite clear. You know, dear reader, dear hearer, don't lose sight of the fact that human beings and animals are very close, have got a great deal in common, and this text is not doing anything to diminish the closeness between humanity and the animal kingdom. However, human beings are more than just animals. So, there's a closeness, there's a similarity, great similarities, but there is a critical difference. And in looking at this critical difference, we once again see the, the attack, if that's the right word to use, which Genesis makes on the world view of its time, on the mythologies of its, of its own era. If we go to verse 26, then God said, <clears throat> let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and so on. Let us make. Now, of course, the plural here has entranced interpreters for centuries. You could float a battleship in the ink that has been used talking <laughs> about why does the text use the plural here? Um, now, having asked that question, I need to confess something. That, as I said, there are many suggestions. One, for example, well, it's obviously the Trinity, isn't it? Obviously. Well, not obviously. Uh, because us simply means more than one, right? Could be two, couldn't it? 57? 
It could be 1,990. It could be any number greater than one. So it doesn't necessarily point to the Trinity. Numerous suggestions have been made. Uh, there isn't a single suggestion that uh, doesn't have some kind of a problem. So I'm not giving you the definitive answer here, just the one that I know is correct. <laughs> so it's not the definitive answer. Any solution as to why do we have the plural here has to deal with an uncomfortable question, which is this. Why does the plural occur in verse 26 and in no other verse? For example, if it's the Trinity, why is it the Trinity suddenly there in verse 26? Not in the verse 25 verses, nor from verse 27 onwards, but only in verse 26. So, whatever solution we come up to, it has to give a, an answer to why only this verse uses the plural. And what I think the answer is, you know, I will not sail the seven seas with evangelistic zeal putting my life on the line for this one, but I think the answer is that it is a Hebrew idiom which is known as the plural of deliberation. Now, what is the plural of deliberation? Well, it suggests this, that in the Hebrew language, when the author wished to underline the significance of a particular point, they would shift from the singular to the plural. So this is where this is the equivalent of underlining highlighters, asterisks in the margin. Please take note of this. Um, let me give you one more example. There's only one other example of this in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. That's in Genesis 11, 7 to 8. Come, let us go down. Okay? Let, let us go down. Who goes down? Well, the Lord, right? Let us go down. It's the Lord who does the action. This would tie in with the idea that we have the plural here in chapter 11, verse 7, let us go down at Babel, and we have the plural in Genesis 1, 26, let us make humanity, in order to underline the great, great significance of the uh, act about to be undertaken. In Genesis, beings in the image of God are about to be created. If ever you want to use the plural of deliberation, it's here. Please take note how significant this is. And at Babel, let us go down and confuse their language. The event here is going to have an impact on the rest of human history and culture until the Lord comes. <coughs> Changes human society radically, so it's a very significant event. So, I think that might well be the reason for the plural of deliberation. So, if, if that is the case, what it's, one thing it's saying is that human beings are exceptionally important. <clears throat> so, just bear that in mind for a minute. How much longer do I have? I know from when you started, and now we'll have 15 minutes. And okay. We'll come back All right. Day. Okay, well, I'll, 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 I'll get that. <coughs> yeah, right. Um... Now it also says something else, you remember, back in chapter 126. Let us make let us make man, let us make humanity what? In in our image. Now what does that mean? Well, if you can float one battleship in the ink that's been done on the, the plural, you can you could float the entire British Navy with what does it mean to be in the image of God? I can't go into all of those details, but the basic fact, I think, is this, that in the world where Genesis was living and having its being, kings established images of themselves throughout their territory. This is my territory. I'm going to put an image of myself here and here and here to demonstrate who it is who <coughs> rules this territory. So when human beings are said to be the image of God, 
I think it's a cultural way of saying that human beings are God's representatives on earth, exercising the power which God has given to them throughout the territory of God, which is, which is the whole earth. So being in the image of God, there are many other things, but one thing being in the image of God means is that we are God's representatives on earth. So here's just one statement from a scholar who says that from the beginning, God chooses not to be the only one who has or exercises creative power. God establishes a power-sharing relationship with humans. So this shows, once again, the significance of human beings in God's creation. Now, why, why is this important? Why spend time doing that? Well, once again, this, this flies in the face of the uh, generally accepted views of the time. Let me give you a couple of statements, um, one by an Egyptologist, another by a Mesopotamian expert. Human beings, in the ancient world generally, human beings possessed little dignity and worth and were thought to be merely slaves of the gods. That's what you are, human beings in the other mythologies, you're slaves of the gods to s just deal with their, uh, their needs, and that's it. Uh, another statement here. In the ancient worldview, people were slaves to the gods with no dignity other than that which came from the knowledge that the gods could not get along without humans to meet their needs. So, we have a contrast here. In Genesis, human beings are significant. Plural of deliberation, let us make. This being is important. In the image of God, God's representatives acting with the power in, given to them by God. That's who human beings are. So it is a statement of, of hope. It cuts through the fatalism <coughs> of simply being the the lackeys to the gods. That's what Genesis has in its sights, and that's what it cuts down with this assertion of humanity's true worth. Now, uh, time is almost up, so I, let me um, quickly deal with uh, the final day of creation, which begins in chapter 2, the seventh day. I don't know if you've noticed this, but the beginning of the account of the seventh day of creation begins with what appears to be a contradiction. And it's a contradiction which has troubled translators over the centuries. You notice what it says. Thus, so we've been through all the first six days of creation, right? And it says, thus, the heavens and the earth were finished. So, when was it finished then? We've got days one to six, and this statement says, thus the heavens and earth were finished. So they were finished when? By the end of day six. Here's the first six days, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Okay, so God's finished, end of day six. Thus, the heavens and earth were finished and all their multitude, and on the seventh day God finished the work. But I thought it was finished. See, it reminds me sometimes of, I had students at college who come to me a minute before the deadline with their paper. They say, here it is, it's finished. I, I've just got to do the bibliography, the final paragraph, and the introduction, right? But it's finished. I say, right, just a minute, is it finished or is it not finished? Well, it's finished, I just haven't... Finished it. <laughs> and that's what this sounds like. Thus the heavens and earth were finished, and on the seventh day God finished the work. It's either finished or it isn't. So, translators have had a difficulty then trying to figure this one out. So, the solutions, one solution, you might enjoy this, is simply to change the word seventh to sixth. 
That solves the problem, clearly. Uh, this is what the New English Bible did. That's what the Septuagint, the Greek translation, did. It just said, on the sixth day, God completed all the work that he'd been doing. Okay? And on the seventh day, he, he, he uh, ceased from all his work. So he completed it on the sixth, and he rested on the seventh. Well, that's a neat way of doing it. It's just that it isn't what the text says. But, you know, as is often the case with theologians, don't let the text get in the way of a good idea. <laughs> the New International Version. Uh, the nearly innocent version. Or, <laughs> or the nice innocent version. You, you'll, you'll pick up that I'm not a fan of the NIV. Well, it gets around this by translating it as a pluperfect. By the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So that's a way of getting around it. See, so now, now we've got it. Now, I believe that all of these attempts are um, understandable, but wrong. Because, uh, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude, and on the seventh day God finished the work which he set out to do. I think this makes perfect sense. What was finished by the end of the sixth day? Well, the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth are finished. And what are the heavens and the earth? Well, the heavens and the earth is the physical universe. What you can see, what you can touch, you can smell. Put it in a balance, you can take it to a laboratory and work on it. But what does God do on the seventh day? He creates what? The Sabbath. Holy time. Sanctified time. You can't touch that. You can't, you can't go into Tesco and ask, what's your special offer on holy time this week? It, it isn't part of the physical, the physical world. So I think what the verse is doing is pointing out something very important as it comes to a conclusion. The heavens and the earth are finished. The physical objects are finished. But God's work of creation isn't yet finished. God's work of creation is not yet finished until he creates holy time, sanctified time which you can't see, you can't touch, you can only experience. Because any view of creation which eliminates the holy is an unsatisfactory view of creation. It's pointing out that ultimately <coughs> creation is more than, as we would put it, atoms and molecules and whatever. It is a blessed and holy enterprise. It is steeped in God's holiness. And we need to, we need to observe that. I am now finishing with just a few brief summary points. We know uh, extensive uh, exegesis on this. What does Genesis 1 tell us about God? Maybe I could be a little bold and say, what did Genesis want to tell us about God? Not what do we want Genesis to tell us about God, but what does Genesis feel it was important to say about God? Well, first of all, he brings order out of chaos. He's the Lord of time and space. He's a personal and eternal God. He is distinct from creation and stands outside it. There's only one God, so he creates effortlessly. And there's only one God, so the heavenly bodies are just lights. And what does Genesis 1 say about us? It tells us that we are not the climax of creation. There is room for humility. But we do have a high status in God's eyes. We are God's representatives on earth, and we're not victims of fate, but have a relationship with a personal God. And then final implications is that it is the Sabbath, holy time, which is the climax of creation. And this holy time shows that creation is ultimately a divine and holy enterprise.
When we read Genesis 1, not in our 21st century context, but in its own context, I think it helps to reveal what the main point of Genesis 1 is about and how we might be able to appropriate Genesis in the 21st century. Um, Genesis 1 is a radical statement which flies in the face of received wisdom in the world in which Genesis came into existence. And it would be a pity if we made Genesis 1 a touchstone of conservatism rather than a statement of radical faith. <laughs>